ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Now we are hydrated, or at least prepared for hydration. I'd like to get this underway. Thank you all for, for attending, and welcome to Singapore, those who are non-residents. Uh, we've been launching an Adelphi book uh, with an Asia theme uh, here since 2011. Um, and I'm delighted uh, today to introduce to you uh, Dr. Matteo Duchatel and Jonas Perella plesner uh, authors of our new Adelphi book, uh, China's Strong Arm. Uh, I will let them explain it rather than me. Well, let me go to brief introductions to our, our speakers and authors. Uh, Jonas Perella Plesner um, is uh, one of those lucky people who is able to span the worlds of diplomacy and think tankery. Um, he's a, uh, an employee of the Danish Diplomatic Service, currently posted in Washington, D.C., but has had stints out at a development NGO focused on Asia, and also uh, not so many years ago now um, uh, as a senior fellow for the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, also, a few years back from that, he was Denmark's senior advisor for Northeast Asia and China. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mathieu Duchatel is uh, a senior researcher for CIPRI. He's based in, uh, in Beijing, has been for several years. Um, the plan is simply for, for our authors to speak for approximately 25 minutes, um, and then to open this up for questions. We really welcome your questions. Um, and uh, I think, Jonas, you're going to be your first. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. First of all, a, a personal big thanks to you as, as editor of the book to ISS for, uh, for hosting us here and making this uh, possible and uh, also particularly to Sarah Johnston back home in, in London who has also been doing the big chunk of, of editing the team together with us. Of course, as always with authors, the sort of errors and omissions remain uh, our own, but uh, thanks a lot for doing uh, a great job uh, on this and it's a great pleasure actually to see it here. It's, it's my own first time that I, I hold it in, in, in my own hand here and, and see a printed copy of it, uh, which of course always with a book is, is, is something uh, particular. So for us it's also really a book launch where, where we get to see the book here for the first time. So um, uh, the book China Strong Arm, um, Protecting Citizen and Assets Abroad, its main sort of hypothesis is that um, looks at how China is increasing the size and capacity to protect nationals and assets abroad, and these effects on Chinese foreign policy. Uh, so that's basically what's sort of the driver and, and what we examine in the book. And it both sort of looks at how China has increased its capacity and, and its willingness to uh, protect uh, nationals abroad. Uh, one very topical example is just really recently in, in, in March 2015, uh, Chinese frigates uh, went into war torn Yemen and um, evacuated 629 Chinese citizens, um, as well as 279 other foreign nationals. Um, and so that's actually uh, just recently and also what we, we, we start the, the book with. Uh, this was a sort of historical move for China. It was also uh, a novel step in the sense that it was the first time that the PLAN um, intervened in directly in, uh, in an evacuation uh, abroad. And it was a very sort of vivid reminder and, and demonstrated China's new capacity to protect the nationals in faraway places. The Chinese ambassador to, uh, to Yemen um, talked about Noah's Ark, as the evacuation uh, was called, that it reflected a significant growth in China's comprehensive national power. So this means that sort of non-combatant evacuations um, is a thing that the um, uh, has come to stay, and I think that China has been doing a lot more of. Actually, if you look at the year 2011, uh, Chinese uh, rescued more than 47,000 citizens, more than in preceding uh, five decades of the um, People's uh, Republic history. So that also, again, is sort of a figure that, that shows sort of the significant growth. So what we in the book say is that China, in this way, has sort of adapted uh, a responsibility to protect of its own citizen, meaning that it's also sort of inscribed an in official doctrine that it's uh, protecting nationals abroad, which became an official sort of foreign policy concept with the 18th uh, Party Congress um, as uh, Xi Jinping moved into uh, to power. Um, and we also see it in it reflected in uh, the, the white paper on, on defense, both the one in 213 and uh, I think even more prominently in 215, which Mathieu will speak more about uh, later. So what's the background to, to all this? Um, what we talk about in the book is there's a new sort of global risk map to China. It, that's one where its companies have sort of grown massively uh, abroad as part of the going out strategy. 
they brought along workers. Uh, there's a growing mass of, of Chinese uh, tourists abroad. Uh, basically means that Chinese are often in, in faraway places, are often in unstable parts of the, of the world. Um, we see that, of course, particularly also in, in oil exploration. Um, and, um, and so in, in, to sum up China, there's just sort of few regions of the world where China now doesn't have a presence. And it, it's probably likely to be even more augmented in the years to come with the whole concept of the new Silk Road. Uh, and all the construction and, and uh, um, transportation that's going to, infrastructure that's going to be built uh, linked to that. Um, so here there is a, a sort of tension between a Chinese uh, official government policy on, on foreign policy, which is generally sort of risk averse, and at the same time you have companies that are very sort of risk prone because this is the places where there are opportunities, be it in, in Sudan, as we explore in the book, or Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, so these are many of the places that Chinese companies go and their citizens go to work on big uh, construction projects. Um, so therefore I highlight that we have as part of the, the book this, and I think this has been sort of distributed, this sort of risk map that sort of shows both Chinese regulations, it shows uh, Chinese, Chinese that have been killed uh, abroad sort of, um, and, and kidnappings as well, which are part of what we uh, explore in the book. And just briefly to mention what are the cases we, we then sort of dig into into the book. We both look at Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan, which is a really particular danger zone for Chinese workers. Um, both with ki kidnappings, it's actually one of the areas where you can say some of the Chinese government interest in trying to protect citizens started when, uh, when there were killings back in 2004. Um, and then we look at Libya, which of course in, a, in many ways is sort of seminal uh, evacuation in uh, 2011, where in, in 12 days in late February, beginning March, uh, China managed to rescue more than 35,000 of their own workers coming out by truck, ship, uh, and airplanes out of uh, the turmoil when Gaddafi's Libya went up in, into, uh, into flame. Um, then we look at the Mekong River, which is a slightly different case, but look at Chinese sailors, 13 Chinese sailors that got killed in 2011, and the sort of uproar that created inside China, so it links with the whole question of public scrutiny, how much does it uh, matter with the, the Chinese public also needs to see sort of that the government takes action in these cases. And, and here in particular, uh, when, as I mentioned, the link with foreign policy, the fact that there was contemplated inside the Ministry of Public Security to use a drone as part of the way of getting back at Nao Khan, which is the, then the Burmese drug, uh, uh, drug lord who was allegedly behind the killings of the, the Chinese sailors. That ended up not coming to fruition and instead um, in collaboration with um, authorities in the other countries, China uh, got now come back to, to China and, and both prosecuted and executed him in China, which was also unprecedented in the sense that it was a crime that was actually done outside of Chinese territory and you therefore see a sort of first element of sort of extraterritorial justice in, uh, in the way that case was handled. Uh, then we look at the Sudan, where ch Chinese state-owned companies ventured in originally basically just for um, uh, for the oil, but have then since become embroiled in, in many different uh, foreign policy conundrums from uh, from Darfur to the, uh, in the, the gradual independence of South Sudan and, and linking up with a, with a new country, where we see many sort of very pragmatic aspects of how uh, uh, China has both protected interest and, and engaged uh, much more proactively. Um, and back to the title, I mean, why we, we chose China's strong arm. There were sort of historical parallels, which were the ones that we, we sort of got inspired from. Uh, and in an earlier version, it was uh, when we submitted it back, it was actually called China's Great Power Burdens. And, and sort of to compare it actually, not in a negative way, but to earlier powers like the UK, like, like the US sort of rise to, to power, where it was having all these commercial, human presence abroad that actually gradually sort of pulled out uh, the state. And we see something similar with, uh, with uh, China. So, I mean, just as the US back in 1914, as it tiptoed to great power status, built the Panama Canal, and later had lots of conundrums about the Sonians, the original inhabitants of the canal, and, and, and many other issues. Uh, I think when we now see ch a Chinese company that's looking to build a Nicaragua Canal, um, crossing uh, the isthmus, it will probably, which would, looks just like a business venture, will probably also entail many more involvements at, at, uh, at local level for, for the Chinese government as well. 
Um, so, and, and the actual quote actually comes from sort of the British um, Foreign Secretary at the time back in the 1850s, Palmerston, who at that time talked about British subject uh, actually with a quote from, from uh, ancient Rome talking about that Civis uh, Roman was so a Roman citizen as a way of being protected everywhere. And then Palmerston sort of said, a British subject in whatever land he may be shall feel confident that the watchful life and the strong arm of England will protect him from injustice and wrong. So what we're looking at is, of course, to what length is, is China willing to, in the, in the same way of also now as a, moving to a great power status to protect its, its nationals and interests abroad and how that squares with, uh, with its foreign policy. Um, so um, basically, as part of the thesis, that the, the fact that these Chinese interests are expanding as, as, as much as they are makes that the Chinese state is, is increasingly compelled to follow suit. And so studying China's new risk map, as, as we try to do in the book, I think, uh, is what we hope both for. Scholars, uh, policymakers, and others will be a way of basically seeing patterns where China is likely to um, uh, to seize interest, either on the threat or or a sort of a new willingness to uh, to protect them. Um, and so, finally, I mean, when everybody here is looking at, at, I imagine this to be one of the big topics of the coming days here, Shangri La, the South China Sea, and how how this evolves. Uh, I think we've tried to sort of look at it different aspect of China's great power rise, and uh, one with potentially also very sort of long-term and, and uh, deep implication for how, how China is going to protect its, its interest uh, globally. And uh, with that, I'll turn over to you. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, as you said, the uh, South China Sea will be pretty much in the spotlight um, at the Shangri-La Dialogue. And, and the book points out to another area of very rapid change in China's foreign policy. Um, China's policy on the South China Sea has started to change five years ago, uh, 2009, 2010. These were the first years when the word assertiveness was mentioned. Uh, but the issue of uh, the protection of national services, um, it's, it's really easy to date when it started to change. It was in 2004, uh, and there were three attacks, um, one in Sudan, one in Afghanistan, and, and one in Pakistan, and they brought the issue to the attention of the top leadership in Beijing and also the general public, because there was uh, a lot of media coverage in China. So is there a connection between the two, uh, maritime disputes on the one hand, uh, this other area of Chinese foreign policy that we've been looking at in the book? Um, so far, not much. Uh, we would argue that uh, the policy changes regarding maritime disputes and, and towards the nationals overseas have responded to completely different logics. Uh, and, and there has been a divide between uh, foreign policy in the region and, and foreign policy, uh, global foreign policy, uh, when, when looking at China's foreign policy. But uh, if you look at the recently published white paper on uh, national defense, uh, I think it starts connecting the dots and, uh, and narrowing the gap between the regional level and the, and the global level. Uh, and the global level uh, is getting increasingly securitized, and, and, and that's what we are describing in the book. Um, and, and, and on the one hand, uh, regional disputes uh, are, the, are a major priority. On the other hand, this is clearly now a major priority of China's foreign policy. Uh, and obviously, the, the new Silk Road uh, will make this uh, even more important and, and will connect the two levels uh, even more in, in the near future. Uh, so let me raise two questions that we are exploring in the book uh, and that I think are relevant for the, in, in the context of this dialogue today. So first, uh, what does the book tell us about foreign policy change in China? Uh, there are three important things. One is that change is driven by events uh, rather than grand strategy. Um, and, and today, um, in fact since 2012, the, the protection of nationals and uh, interests overseas is integrated in, in China's official policy guidelines. Uh, but this came after change had already taken place. Uh, there had been 10 evacuations before 2012. Uh, Libya had already been accomplished, and uh, consular protection was already being strengthened, and the Ministry of Commerce were, was already revising the rules uh, governing investment overseas so that risks, uh, security risks, would be uh, taken more seriously. 
Uh, and the other, only strategy in the early 2000s that really applied to, to this issue was the so-called uh, um, going out strategy, uh, telling Chinese state-owned enterprises and firms to, to go overseas. But there was no security dimension, uh, and, and the security implications had been completely overlooked. And this was a very broad policy guideline, which had, in fact, very, very concrete results. Um, and, and in fact, what happened is that the government agencies, uh, the state-owned enterprises, and the firms adjusted their behavior and their strategy uh, to take advantage of, of this strategy, uh, go, the going out strategy. And um, and I think that this can be a this may be a lesson for for those who think that the one belt one road uh, is just an empty slogan, uh, because what is happening again is that everyone is kind of adjusting to the uh, grand strategy of the state and trying to take advantage of it. But this time there's a difference um, compared to the going out strategy in the early 2000s. That's, uh, and, and the difference is that the state and basically everyone in China is aware of the security implications of uh, one belt, one road. And, and one example is Pakistan. Um, there's already uh, a special military unit being established by, uh, by the Pakistani military uh, to provide security to the Chinese workers uh, and, and engineers uh, who are working on the infrastructure projects. Second, change is driven by interest uh, rather than by institutions or ideas. Uh, that's always the question in political science when looking at policy change. Uh, does it come from interests, institutions, or ideas? I think that uh, in, in this case, it's particularly clear that uh, the, the, the change came from changing interests. Uh, but at the same time, uh, institutions have adapted, uh, and, and we describe this in the book uh, quite at length. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, the PLA, MOFCOM, many state-owned enterprises have had to change um, to adapt to this new reality. And, and ideas have also been changing uh, as a result. Uh, and if you remember the debates uh, just uh, 15 years ago regarding non-interference in China, it was more about how to respond to the new norm of humanitarian intervention, uh, how to respond, in fact, to the pressure of the West on that. <coughs> and, and today, the, the debate is really about uh, overseas interests. And, and three main takeaway regarding this uh, foreign policy change in China, um, I think that public scrutiny and uh, domestic gains uh, for the state are very important uh, to give a momentum to, um, to, to, a, to a change when it's going on. And, uh, and this particular area, especially the nationals, more than the assets, is clearly uh, an area where the state and the public are establishing a new, new type of relationship uh, on, on diplomacy. Um, second question, what does, the book, what does the book tell us about the future of non-interference? Well, clearly, um, there's been pragmatic adaptation uh, and, and, and growing flexibility because uh, hands off approach is just not an option for China. And this was the result of unexpected events. Uh, we both stated. And concretely, um, it's, uh, the, the outcome was that China became engaged in mediation, such as in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. That China is now speaking to rebels uh, and not only to national governments, uh, and, it, and, and, and this in, in, in several countries. That the PLA Navy and the PLA Air Force have been involved in non-combatant evacuations. Uh, and, and, that's, and that the Ministry of Public Security has law enforcement patrols overseas in Southeast Asia. So that, that's a big broadening of um, you know, non-interference as we knew it. Uh, but at the same time, non-interference remains clearly a signature policy for China. Um, and it's very important because it differentiates China from the West uh, in many developing countries. It's in the Constitution. It's in the 1982 Constitution. Uh, so China has uh, still advantages at, in keeping uh, you know, no, the non-interference principle. So the question is more, are we reaching a tipping point? And can we think of scenarios of uh, radical change regarding non-interference because of the challenges faced by nationals overseas? So far, when you look at evacuations, the PLA has only had to be involved in areas that were secure. Uh, in Libya and in Yemen, uh, the points of evacuations uh, were safe. Um, so there was no need to secure the area. 
And, uh, and if you look at the 17 evacuations, the 15 others were all carried out by civilian means, charter flights, ferry boats, and that's China's fare reduction, clearly. Um, but what would happen uh, if there is an evacuation to be carried out from a hostile country or a most hostile area in the country? That's an open question. So will China become more like um, the UK, the US, France, or Israel? Uh, four countries that have resorted to a military force uh, to extract hostages. Um, I would not, I, I don't think that it's out of the question that uh, Chinese special forces are involved in the future in extraction operations. So how far can it go? Uh, I think that potentially it can go very far, but um, I also think that events will continue to drive change. And that's a new normal for China. Uh, the term is used for the economy, but that's also true of China's global footprint. Um, with Chinese citizens scattered across the world, uh, China is no longer unnoticed. And, uh, and there have been cases where Chinese nationals were targeted because they were Chinese for political reasons, for example, in Pakistan. Um, a final point to conclude uh, regarding the implications of this for China's role uh, as an international security actor. Uh, it means that there's now a human security dimension in China's foreign policy, uh, that individuals are part of the national interest. So that's, that's a big change. And, and in that sense, you could argue that China is becoming more like the West. And um, you could see this both ways. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, uh, if you're a pessimist uh, from the West, you could argue that the protection of nationals overseas is a recipe for nationalistic mobilization and that it could justify the deployment of military forces overseas for narrow uh, national interests. But if you are optimistic, you can, you can see an incentive for greater cooperation, uh, particularly with the US and with Europe. And there's already a record in Libya between China and Europe, with the European states facilitating the evacuation of 36,000 Chinese nationals. And clearly on the ground, uh, if you ask diplomats who have been involved in evacuations, they will tell you that there is a need to cooperate operationally uh, because the resources of states are, security resources of the states are limited and, and you need some degree of coordination, basic coordination. So one lesson that can be drawn from the book, and I'll end up on that, is that there is room uh, for cooperation uh, with China uh, on very concrete cases uh, on, on the basis of a convergence of interests uh, rather than abstract principles. And in fact, um, this issue, the, the protection of nationals overseas, is a way to circumvent uh, normative differences between China and, and, and the West. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, move straight on to questions now. We have a, a microphone, so if you raise your hand and then wait for the microphone to reach you. Super, if you just briefly identify yourself by name. Uh, first gentleman here in the second row of the white shirt. Second row. Eric the Stars and Stripes. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on that last comment you made uh, and get a sense of whether you're an optimist or a pessimist um, as to uh, China's uh, intentions in the future. Well, I guess the interesting part is not really about me, but uh, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm, I'm more optimistic than pessimistic on that particular issue. Um, I, I think that, um, especially from a European perspective, um, so, so I, I would stress here that it's not a US-China perspective. I think that's from a US-China, from the perspective of US-China relations, it's a little bit different. Uh, from, from, a, from a European perspective, that's, that's probably the only area where um, there is something concrete that um, uh, the Europeans can, can do with China in terms of international security, uh, especially in Africa, maybe, maybe even in, in, in Central Asia, wh whenever there is a security crisis. So it is more as an opportunity than, uh, than a threat. Do you want to add something? <coughs> No, yeah, the, the last point of it seems to be an opportunity for us as well to sort of look at, as I point out, where is China's risk map and how is that going to influence their calculus? I think if you look at South Sudan, for example, you've seen that with all the big interest, human presence, and, and oil interest that China has there, 
taking large stake in, in, in both the country, but also now in, in, in deploying to enlist uh, their first sort of combat battalion. And, and where it's added in the mandate of, uh, from, from you in New York uh, earlier this year, when there's a revision of the mandate, that it can also protect oil, oil workers uh, as part of that. So there you see a sort of coupling of, of national interest together with, with sort of international peasants. I think for all of us, it's a good thing that, that uh, China fields uh, troops to sort of help stabilize uh, South Sudan. And at the same time, it's, there's probably also sort of tight link with, with where where do they have sort of the most presence? I mean, an example we we put out in the in the book a little bit more speculative is looking at something at Angola, where you have more than two hundred thousand uh, Chinese probably uh, present and enormous interest. If that country, which it is not, but were to break down in instability, we could certainly have China being the ones for clamoring in the international, in up in New York in the Security Council for an international force and perhaps even be the one sort of. Uh, willing to, uh, to field the uh, truth for that. So I, I think it's more in that vein of looking at where is the China is exposed and how is that likely to sort of, uh, sort of drive its reaction. And that's where there's collaboration opportunities for the West. Thank you, people in VOA. Um, the world, including the United States, has uh, repeatedly pledged to accommodate China's drive, and there's need for that, obviously. But what you can see in the last few days that uh, China <coughs> and United States are currently on a, uh, seems like they're on a collision course. So I wonder if uh, what has made the United States seem to draw a red line in terms of the land nation in the South China Sea. And do you see any chance for the two countries to come out peacefully without, say, you know, having a limited war or something else? Thanks. Thanks for the question. I mean, it's not a book about the China and China Sea. As, as I was alluding to in my comments, I think this is going to be the big theme of the conference over the couple, uh, the next couple of days. So, I mean, as Mathieu, I think, pointed out, there are, there are a couple of, of links, perhaps. I mean, I think if I see a link to, to what we are studying, it's maybe in some of the comments that's come out from Chinese official sites saying that what they're building in the South China Sea could also be used for a humanitarian mission, could also be used for what we just saw recently in Yemen, that China has a bigger sort of military presence that can also be used as a sort of public good in the sense that China, China in that case sort of evacuated uh, foreign uh, citizens. I think they, of course, would have an interest in, in explaining that uh, South China Sea in, in that way. And that's, I think, the only link I, I can see to what we're talking about right here. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the two authors for this contribution about uh, China's foreign policy. It's a uh, timely and welcome contribution and uh, adds something which has not been looked at very carefully until now. My question is that so far we have talked a lot about the protecting of Chinese citizens, evacuations, military, Pakistani military units, etc. What about the other aspects? protecting assets abroad. If you compare with the US, the US assets abroad are mainly almost exclusively owned by US multinational companies. Chinese assets abroad are almost exclusively owned by the Chinese state, by state-owned enterprises. How does China look upon that? What are the instruments envisaged? What do China have any risk assessment methods uh, to, to cope with let's say, a possible nationalization of Chinese investments abroad. It opens up a whole Pandora's box. Um, thank you, uh, very important question. Uh, what China has done to protect its national overseas is more obvious or has attracted more attention than what it does to protect its assets overseas. But clearly, Libya was a major turning point uh, because there were losses uh, when Chinese SOEs had to leave the country and, um, and, and leave, their, leave their investment be behind them. Um, so there have been uh, changes, uh, but mostly on the regulatory front, um, so that companies that invest uh, overseas have to pass through a process uh, that is uh, more demanding than in the past regarding um, including a risk assessment 
and, uh, and there's also more incentives to look at the possible security risks. Um, that also has an impact on, uh, on the insurance sector. Uh, and, and you can also see now that um, there's a burgeoning um, um, consultancy sector that is uh, developing in China to provide expertise uh, to these SOEs. But, but, but that's on the regulatory side. Um, and SOEs, the, the SOEs themselves have, uh, have done a lot. Um, but, but it's not always easy to really look into this uh, because they, have, uh, they are quite secretive um, and, and bureaucratic. Uh, but some of them have um, you know, um, uh, uh, risk assessment units. They have created that. They have research institutes that look into potential risks. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so they are, they are moving uh, and they have taken many initiatives. Um, when you think of CNPC, uh, the major uh, oil company, uh, I think that uh, it's, uh, it, it's on record that it had, um, it lost more than 40 employees uh, in, in the past 10 years. So that for any company, that's, uh, that's very big. So they have to take this into consideration. Just a couple of quick points. I mean, one is that it's the two are linked in the sense that since state-owned companies often on high infrastructure, oil, other, Bit of the projects, they often bring a lot of Chinese workers. So there, there's a direct link, you can say, between the assets and, and the workers, and that we also uh, uh, trace you in the book. And then to echo what Mature was saying, there is a big focus in the Chinese companies now on risk management, and also inside the government, particularly because of China's peculiar structure of having sort of mainly state owned enterprises, meaning are they then ultimately responsible, or is there a sort of liability and, and market failure basically saying if you can go out and go into a very sort of dangerous country and you don't basically make sure to ensure your own way out, it's, it's then the government uh, that has to sort of bail you out. And, and, and of course here there's a sort of internal tension between uh, within companies as well as being in a sense part of the government apparatus and at the same time being sort of independent commercial risk seeking uh, uh, creatures. Which is also why, which is something we touched upon in the book, there is development of sort of sector of private security companies, which of course is also used widely by, by Western companies uh, as one of the sort of the ways to, to get out of that. But there you would have to question as well uh, if you had a sort of black border incident of, of, of saying if a, if a Chinese state owner company protected by a, a private security company came into something that ended up in the loss of local life, for example, wouldn't that still sort of uh, impinge back on, on China as a whole? Uh, because of the, the structure with, uh, with state owned enterprises. So it's, uh, and I think it's something there's a really big interest on among the companies. We both, Mitch and I, made several sort of workshops in, in, in China on, on risk management and, and, and foreign policy together with the Chinese companies that have been really interested in, in this debate. Uh, I have uh, three names on my, on my pad currently. Uh, there's plenty of time for questions if others would like, would like to catch my eye. Uh, John, I'll come to you now. And you, sir. First, please, a lady in the, in the aisle. Uh, my question is, in terms of China's future foreign policy, do you think it will take up a more active role in protecting its citizens abroad, and as well as maintaining peace and security for the entire region? <clears throat> well, what we describe in the book is that uh, for China to protect its national services, there are many technical measures that government agencies can take, uh, such as you know, increasing the capacity of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to provide consular protection, or developing uh, the PLA Navy, for example, or taking regulatory reforms um, so that uh, workers are less exposed to risks. But indeed, it's also about uh, you know politics and diplomacy uh, and the role that uh, China plays in uh, in, in conflicts. And, and I think that uh, Sudan is a, is a pretty good example of how the two combine. Um, and you have to um, you know, provide security on the ground for your workers, but at the same time, it's not sufficient. You have to be involved in, uh, in conflict management. Um, yeah, I mean, my short answer would be yes. I think that's, that's sort of part of the, the book is, is that we see China taking this sort of more active role. I think also to highlight one important that we see very sort of event-driven I mean, although it's added to the sort of the official foreign policy catalog, and there's a lot of, as, as Matthew just touched upon, technical adjustments in the ministry and so on, I think 
every case like Libya, like Yemen has a little bit has element of sort of ad hoc that this is, has happened and then the, the government has, has had to find a way to sort of to, um, to secure its interests. So I think right now the fact that there's been relatively successful immigrations for, for a long period also means that if you saw something go wrong in a country that was unstable and where there wasn't the same access to the sea or the same possibility, that could of course only raise the stakes for what uh, both the Chinese public and the <coughs> reputation of what the, the government is basically capable of, uh, of doing. But I think a lot of this will also be depend on, on sort of the events that drive foreign policy. Jonathan Marks, Jonathan Marks, BBC, where's the camera? Thank you, Jonathan Marks, BBC. Um, very interesting book, and I, I was right. I mean, a lot of the discussion was obviously about uh, military means, and most obvious thing, evacuations and so on. But I was very struck by your example of the, uh, the drug lord, the drug baron, who was uh, uh, sort of seized and, 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 and tried and, and executed. And I'm just wondering, um, I, I mean, I'm not suggesting fancifully that there's any comparison with the United States and its legal action against FIFA, but the, the, the idea of extraterritoriality of Chinese law, uh, the idea that China might want to apply its own business in its office areas, terrorism and crime and things like that. But, you know, is there a sense in which this could draw China into a rather different attitude towards uh, the role of international law and the, the part it could play uh, as an element in a wider security framework? I mean... I think, first of all, what we saw with the sort of the Macau River case was also the rise of one I I internal actor that, that we see in, in, in several, it's the Ministry of Public Security that basically was, was in the lead, uh, particularly at that time, sort of reinforced by the fact that Zhu Yongkang uh, was still in power and sort of very powerful uh, Politburo member and, and uh, heading the sort of the public security uh, uh, part of it. Actually, he's a character that goes through the book because he's also the one that started CNPC's investment in Sudan in 96. So. We have him in, in, in sort of several, several instances uh, throughout the book. Um, so I think there's that. So I mean, there you have a sort of internal actor that's used to dealing with internal problems with their own solutions that suddenly have to sort of solve a foreign policy problem, which is why they come up with all these new things. Well, we could drone, we could do, uh, which they ended up doing. We could sort of try to get, get taken back to China and, and make a public trial. And so I think you see sort of new, new ways of basically dealing where some of the sort of in natural uh, in inhibitions of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of saying, well, this doesn't maybe necessarily completely fly with classical non-interference. Um, so, so there's both that bureaucratic element and then there's definitely that element of, uh, of when you now see Chinese interests threat. I mean, the fact that the Chinese public was also, um, that there was so much public scrutiny of the case. I mean, the, the photos of, of uh, these sailors that were the, that have been sort of brutally murdered were, uh, sh uh, displayed around on, on Weibo, Chinese uh, Twitter and social media, all that made also really sort of the need for much more sort of public uh, diplomacy. Before there was a, actually Beijing called in a sort of summit uh, which Zhu Yongkang also led uh, with uh, the other um, riparian nations, with the other sort of Southeast Asian nations uh, in the Mekong and, and ended up agreeing to sort of much broader sort of law enforcement where there are now these joint patrols to go up and down the uh, go up and down the river, which are primarily uh, Chinese-led. So, uh, so definitely, I thought when you were at the U.S., you wouldn't compare it to FIFA. I mean, I, I think I had, which, which ended, not in, <laughs> no, no, but uh, I think we had Noriega at some point of, of the sort of as, as as comparison. I think it ended out in the editing if you search for it in the book, but uh, um, FIFA hadn't happened yet. Christopher Lamb from the National University of Singapore. Uh, two very short questions. I mean, what uh, you seem to imply is the reactive nature of the Chinese responses. I was wondering whether the Chinese government has sort of prepared any preemptive uh, measures, for example, training the companies on corporate social responsibilities when they go overseas. Is there any sort of uh, trend in that direction? Second, very short question. I noticed your working title was Great Power Burden. Uh, in your conversations with the Chinese, do you feel that reluctance that this is an issue of liability, or do they see this as an opportunity for them to engage 
in other ways uh, globally. Thank you. There's, there's a guideline now. Um, it, it's, it's a priority for the state. Um, Li Keqiang said it, others said it. Uh, it's in the white paper for national defense. But at the same time, when you look into the specifics, uh, what are the standard operation procedures, for example, for the PLA, uh, at when, when there will be the next crisis, um, it, it's very difficult to find you know, uh, very detailed uh, plans. Um, so, um, and, and it's hard to say, we haven't really even been able to find during, during our research um, evidence, for example, that uh, the PLA Navy was training specifically uh, for conducting evacuations. Uh, but, but at the same time, Yemen shows that it, does really, it doesn't really take uh, a, lot of, a lot of training, um, at least when the area is already secure. Um, so it's hard to say. Our impression, I think, looking at um, what the different government agencies are doing to prepare for, for the future, is that there's just a sense that um, they are all uh, strengthening their capacity uh, to do more and, and to do and to do better. Uh, so that there's a general sense of um, you know capacity building and uh, institutionalization, and, and I see this as the the, the main way change uh, you know takes place. Um, and then regarding um, uh, other aspects like what is the government doing to um, to, to train companies in corporate social responsibility. Uh, I think it's more like the companies themselves that adapt uh, to the risks, but, but, but then again, uh, Mofcom is playing a very important role um, uh, together with SASAC, in fact, um, to, to reshape the, 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 in, in the environment, the regulatory environment for uh, investing abroad. So that's their main contribution to reducing risks uh, and, and also, um, if you look into like uh, some of the cases, in fact, uh, when you look at the Chinese nationals overseas, a lot of them are employees of SOEs, but indirectly employees of SOEs. They are in fact employed by labor service companies um, that are in fact uh, subcontractors, um, and that's sent labor overseas. And, and on that front, um, uh, and this explains, for example, that during the evacuation from Libya, only 6,000 uh, Chinese nationals were registered with the uh, consulate authorities, uh, and, and, and in the end, like 36,000 were evacuated. The, the gap between the two is huge, and it's true of any uh, country, in fact, uh, especially in Africa. Um, so one of the things that the state has done to avoid this, uh, so uh, to be, to, to in fact, to, to, to be able to have better information on uh, who's where, uh, is to regulate the, the activities of these companies, the labor uh, service cooperation companies, because they are a very important actor in China's presence overseas. Just, just two, two points. I mean, on the first, on your question of, of uh, inside the machinery, I think uh, I would say yeah, the picture, I mean, we have seen sort of all these sort of stepwise improvement in different areas from evacuation to uh, Liability, but still, the overall picture is probably not that there's one one sort of big plan in, in all areas how to deal with this. That it's slightly sort of messy inside uh, China Inc. As some w w would like to uh, call it. Um, so I, th I think that's that's one observation on that one. On the other question of if this is a way China is engaged in other ways, I, I would say yes. I mean, if we go back to to Yemen here recently, of course, that was really sort of shown as a way that, that China is contributing also to. Uh, to uh, that military presence abroad is something benign that the China rescued other other uh, foreign nationals in uh, in that case. Um, uh, I think you would see the same with with, uh, with South Sudan that I, that I also mentioned that the fact that China is now contributing much larger to uh, South Sudanese reconciliation and, and to stabilization also by being part of UNMIS. So 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 in that sense, the fact of having these I interests. Uh, and human presence actually makes China and the Chinese government much more uh, engaged. But what I think finally, and then that's also a little bit of an answer to your first question, there is still that inbuilt tension between a relatively risk averse government and a very sort of risk prone companies. Uh, 
which are in, in very often also in a sense part of the part of the uh, the government by being uh, state owned enterprises. So so that tension I think is, is there to stay. Okay. How would you thought that? Let's see the lady sending us back. Thank you for giving me the chance. I have a question like, uh, in the book you said that uh, China invest overseas and evacuate their own citizens is a risk. <coughs> but how about the US, it uh, built a lot of uh, military bases overseas. So like we compare with the investment and the military bases, which will be more risky in the region? Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I got the question right. Do you mean, what, what is more risky? Uh, is it to have uh, like nationals or bases? Yeah, I mean, compare with the, I mean, compare with the investment of China and the, the military bases of the US, which will be more risk, <coughs> risky in oh. the region. Sorry. Well, that's a tough question. Uh, that's a, in, in, yeah, very different types of risks. Um, of course, bases can be targeted uh, in war zones. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, it's not that unusual. War zone. Soldiers <coughs> are becoming workers. Yeah. Maybe actually the other way around. I mean, many would ask sort of with all these Chinese presence abroad, doesn't China need also bases? <coughs> like, for example, here, the fact that they could do a Yemen, why was that? It was only possible because they were part of the Gulf of Aden patrolling mission, so that they were actually already in the area. Uh, but you could say if that mission at some point stops, China would not have the same sort of naval presence uh, in nearby Africa, and you could discuss would China need some sort of... I think what we highlight in a couple of small examples in, in the book is probably something that's more likely to be sort of dual-use type of arrangement, where we see, for example, in, in Khartoum, where both in the case of the Libya vacation 211, you had uh, Chinese military planes that were able to go first to Saba in, in Libya and then go through Khartoum. And you saw the same in 2013 in South Sudan, that part of the evacuation went up through Khartoum. And there clearly, there seemed to be some sort of arrangement that at least can be triggered quite quickly that, that China has access with military planes to, uh, to Khartoum. It's not at all what could be sort of designed as a, as a base or anything, but at least some sort of arrangement, there is a flexibility to uh, to allow Chinese military presence in, in, in a time here of uh, crisis management. Yeah, one thing I'd like to add uh, to, uh, in answer to your question, I think that for, for China, um, non-interference has really helped uh, Chinese nationals uh, to avoid becoming targets. Uh, and, and in that sense, you can compare you know, the US military presence to the Chinese economic presence. Um, more in terms of, um, you know, what, what are the costs on, on, on your nationals of your foreign policy actions? Uh, and, and if you think, for example, of uh, the Middle East, um, and it's not only the US, it's true also of uh, European countries, and, uh, and, 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 and even J Japanese nationals were uh, killed, beheaded by the Islamic State uh, for political reasons, uh, to send a message uh, and, and, and with a political goal. And so far, this has not happened to, to China. Um, and, and you can argue that this is you know, a, a benefit that China is gaining from um, not being aligned uh, with, with the US on, on crisis in the Middle East. Um, but, but, but at the same time, one, one of the things that we are arguing in the book is that um, this presence that is only economic and, uh, and, and in many, many, in most cases, beneficial to the uh, the local country uh, is also attracting a lot of attention. Uh, and, and there are uh, examples, that, as I said in the presentation, of Chinese nationals being, being targeted uh, because of their nationality, so for political reasons. Um, so that, that's my indirect way to answer your question. Thank you, the theme about the frictionless rise coming to an end is, it runs right throughout the book. Um, the gentleman penultimate row at the back on the, the sun side, please. And then we'll move over to the other side of the room. Uh, thanks very much. In the Yemen case, did you get a sense of the coordination process with uh, the nations of those third country nationals that were evacuated? Could you describe that, please? Uh, 
I mean, the short and very honest answer would be that actually we were doing, uh, finishing the book up in order to get it just to, uh, during the Yemen happened. It, it's in the book, but it's, it's not at all a case we've been through with interviews with both uh, Chinese officials that have been part of it as we've done with, with Libya and, and some of the other cases where we then, in Sudan as well, have been in contact with them before and after. Uh, so, so basically our reading is just based on, um, yeah, I, I had a sense there was some sort of outreach to other countries, so in that sense there was an interest from the Chinese side to, to sort of, to have the mission not just take Chinese, but also take a sort of broader uh, <laughs> continent, but particularly probably from that sort of worry of, of saying, hey, China suddenly has a military presence, and uh, what does this mean? And then say, well, showing, but it's, this is part of, of a sort of benign military presence that also adds something not just to Chinese uh, interests, but uh, more broadly. Okay, uh, gentleman at the back next to the camera, please. Uh, hi, Gurdip Singh from Press Trust of India. With this huge volume of investment that China is making, do you think China will be in a position to take its own private security for its workers into some countries? Um, well, one major obstacle to that is that China has very restrictive uh, firearm regulations. So that's private security companies, um, so their staff cannot train legally in China with firearms. Uh, so that if they go abroad, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a problem. So in fact, uh, in, in countries where Chinese companies have hired private security companies, they have favored uh, hiring foreign uh, private security companies, or sometimes like a, some sort of package uh, with one uh, Chinese private security company, but uh, without firepower, taking the lead and uh, together with um, uh, a Western private security company that, 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 that would provide the, uh, the, the firepower. And um, there has been a debate, actually, uh, in China regarding that. Uh, should China create some sort of uh, Chinese-style black water? Um, some people have been vocally in favor of that, uh, saying that this would be exactly the type of company that China uh, needs uh, to protect its <coughs> investment overseas. But, but I think that the mainstream view is that uh, you know, there's no need to change the, 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 the law, the, the regulatory framework, um, to support the emergence of a, a, a Chinese private security sector. Thank you, uh, Andrew Small from the German Marshall Fund. Uh, congratulations to, to both of you on the book. Um, I have a question um, uh, as a takeoff from the One Belt, One Road and China-Pakistan Economic Corridor um, Initiative. Um, one of the things that has been sort of quite intriguing about a lot of what's been fed out about uh, this, the Pakistan Initiative um, in particular, is that um, this is also supposed to be a kind of stabilization <coughs> plan that all of this money is, is going in, and not just for commercial benefit, but um, to help bring security to China's um, western neighborhood. Um, I'm intrigued from what you've kind of gleaned about the decision-making process between the company and, and, and other bits of the state, how you would envisage this uh, working, because in the past there have clearly been points where operations have been frozen, or people have companies have pulled out of the, the country um, in this sort of new configuration um, is, do you, do you, I mean, how would you see this dynamic working? The government basically saying, um, you know, tough, um, we're bringing stability to Pakistan, so you, you guys have got to stick it out, um, or I mean, how, and financing arms that of course want to make, increasingly want to make money back. But I, I'd be interested to get your sense of how you would, how you would see a sort of decision-making uh, process take place if, say, you know, you have major attacks taking place uh, now that, that, that threaten to derail some of these plans. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Actually, we, we've learned a lot from your book on China-Pakistan relations, and uh, quoted it a lot. Uh, it's hard to add anything new on, on China-Pakistan relations. My, my, my sense is that, um, you know, when, when, when I asked uh, during interviews, what's the difference between now and uh, five years ago. Uh, five years ago, there was already a plan uh, raised by Pakistan 
to build a trade and economic corridor between Guadar and Xinjiang. And, uh, and China politely said yes, but in fact nothing happened. Uh, and the reason why nothing happened was because of security risks. It was too risky to invest a lot of money, money in Baluchistan and uh, in other parts of Pakistan. And now five years later, later in the context of One Belt, One Road, um, there are reports that China is going to invest uh, 40 billion uh, US dollars in Pakistan to build the same infrastructure projects. Well, same, same, but different, but uh, quite, quite the same. Uh, so what, what is the difference? Um, what I have heard is that um, one difference is that Pakistan is now uh, taking Chinese requests for more security uh, more seriously, and they have that they have proven their ability to provide security to particular Chinese firms or nationals. Uh, there are examples in the book of, um, you know, I think it's the the, the head of Sino Hebrew in Pakistan, who's quoted saying that um, you know, the Pakistani police provides helicopters for him and his staff uh, so that they can avoid, you know, terrorist attacks being targeted. And also the reports that. Uh, Pakistan is training a special military unit. I think that Pakistan, in my view, is very interesting uh, in the sense that it's a taste case. Because it's the country with um, you know, a very strong political and military relationship with China, but also very important security risks. And, uh, and it's part of the Silk Road. It's, uh, it's in the, it, between the two roads. So that's the link between the road, uh, you know, uh, the land routes and, and the sea routes. Um, so that's geopolitically, it's, it's an important country. Uh, and, and in fact, Pakistan provides a model. Uh, and the model is, you know, it, it's dangerous, but uh, if you put a lot of security on it, maybe it's, maybe it's possible. Um, so if this works, it will mean that, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in states that have very strong security risks, the model of cooperation will be you know, very strong, um, very strong uh, military and, uh, and police involvement in, uh, in building infrastructure projects. Just, um, and thanks a lot, Andrew, both for your comments, your duly and acknowledgement for, uh, for, for your role here in this book. Um, I just wanted to, on, on your broader point with the stabilization, economic development leads to sort of stabilization. I think there the Chinese a little bit think that the way they've done internally also works externally. Uh, so that by building infrastructure, by building, then then you will na naturally have development and, and that will work. And I think we see cases also inside China, like Tibet, where they sometimes this model doesn't doesn't really work. And even though you build schools and highways and uh, railroads, doesn't necessarily lead to sort of more uh, stability and, and a happier population. So in that sense, I think there's an element of, of, of the model that they're trying to bring. And uh, I say this with a certain amount of humility, also now back as a serving official and as a Dane, and I think originally in our development assistance, we were much trying to, if everybody could just be more, a little bit more like us, Dane, then they would have happier societies. And, uh, um, and that doesn't always work to transplant it. Um, so so, in, so in, that, in that sense, I think there is an element of naivety or thinking that if, if you just bring that Economic development, then all the other issues will be, be solved. Is that the way it works inside China? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a children's toys. Um, uh, gentleman from François Clemenceau, Le Journal du Dimanche. Uh, you write a small paragraph in the book about uh, the fact that China has always been reluctant to create or install some bases, some naval bases abroad, but still. It appears that there are some ongoing negotiations about creating an installation or permanent installation in Djibouti. Do you think it can serve as a model to um, having some other bases in Mediterranean, for example, or in, uh, in South America? You were talking about the, um, the huge amount of uh, working force they, they will have uh, in Central America in the next decade. <coughs> Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the naval base in, in, in Djibouti, um, but um, I, I think that the debate on Chinese naval bases uh, today is kind of fueled by this issue. Um, obviously, if the PLA Navy you know, made the case that this is needed, uh, then there would be kind of uh, 
more convincing uh, politically, internally, and even externally. Because if your base is to protect your nationals overseas, uh, rather than power projection for, for other means, it, it's, it's, clearly, it's clearly different. Uh, it, it sells better. Um, but um, I think that the issue is still being considered. Um, I think that Yemen actually was important in that regard because uh, you know the PLA Navy happens to be just nearby, uh, so it showed that uh, it's important to have a naval presence uh, nearby uh, in case there's really a problem. Um, but so far, China has um, like a flotilla uh, permanently uh, operating in the Gulf of Aden, so it can it can be deployed, uh, you know. Uh, in, in basically in, in Northern Africa and, uh, and, and Eastern Africa <coughs> and the Arab, Arabic Peninsula uh, quite easily uh, without a na na naval base. And my understanding is that um, you know, the agreements that China has uh, with uh, a number of countries, including Yemen actually, uh, Djibouti, uh, and others for uh, replenishment and <coughs> logistical support are actually sufficient uh, to perform the kind of operation that China wants to you know, perform. So my, my, my take on that, on the base, on the, on the, you know, the future of China, the first Chinese na naval base, is that, you know, again, this would take, uh, I think, a, a kind of game-changing event uh, for this to happen. That's my guess. Thank you very much. We've, uh, we've run out of time, although I suspect you'll be able to catch your audience for a few minutes uh, after this event. Oh, just thank you all uh, very much for coming. Uh, um, the book is, uh, is available um, uh, on Kindle for those who like to spare their trees. Otherwise, uh, if you're an ISS member, you're welcome in the mail. Uh, please join me now in thanking our office.